Well, welcome everyone to OSNY. We are so happy to see you here today in worship. So we get started, we're gonna begin by singing Ferris, Lord Jesus. I invite you to sing along as you feel comfortable. again everyone happy may it's may day or as a certain musical band would say it's gonna be may you get the reference and if you don't just ignore me anyway as we get started today i have just a couple announcements um first if you haven't already heard this thursday may 5th at 54 below which is the old studio 54 but the downstairs without the disco and um other activities went on there um Abby Payne, our very own Abby Payne, our music director, is having an album release party. Yay. So she is dropping a brand new album, A Shot in the Dark, and kicking it off with this show at 54 Below. Um, so to celebrate, um, we're hoping to get people to come out and join and be there with her to really cheer her on. There's a special discount for family and friends, whom you are all considered. Um, so that's up on the screens. I believe it's Shot 5. And we'd love to have you come out and support Abby, our, our friend and our sister in Christ. So um, speak to Abby for more details if needed. You can, um, since she's not here, you could reach out to her in other channels. Um, but I'm sure she would love to see you there. Um, I know some of us are already planning on going. It should be a really fun night. Uh, show is at 9.30 on Thursday, if that's an important detail. Uh, and then also, we're very excited to be bringing back our Friday night dinners here at OSNY. So we want to be a church that comes together as a family, not just on Sundays for worship, but outside as well to share each other's joys and challenges and just socialize outside of these four walls. Um, so we would love to have you come out uh, to our Friday night dinner. It's coming up not this coming Friday, but the Friday after. So Friday the 13th. Uh, we will be gathering at Diner Bar, which is just over at 9745 Queens Boulevard, right on the corner, uh, at 7 p.m. So talk to your friends. Maybe you can carpool. Maybe you can walk over together. Uh, but most importantly, sign up on the sheet in the back so that we can make an appropriate-sized reservation uh, so that everyone has a place. And uh, we would just love to have you come out. Again, it's a great way to grow together as a family in Christ um, and to have some fellowship outside of our Sunday worship. So if you could make it Friday 13th uh, at Diner Bar, 7 p.m., sign-up sheet is in the back or talk to Pastor Anthony. We would love to see you there and just have a fun night out together as a church. But with that, I invite you to stand up, greet one another, and we will continue on with our worship service. the poor 
and powerless and all the lost and lonely and all the thieves will come confess know that you
morning. Uh, and the beautiful song that we just sang, if you're wondering who the band is, Casting Crowns, wonderful band, great musicians, but also in terms of theology, very, very accurate uh, in some orthodox Christian teachings and confessions. Definitely a great band to check out. Um, I love the chorus of that song. Brian, could we put that chorus back up? Not because of who I am. There it is. Not because of who I am, but because of what you have done, Lord Jesus. Not because of what I've done, because if I look at what I've done in my life, I can't find anything of great righteousness to be able to earn my salvation, but it's because of who you are, because of your righteousness, because of your sinless life, because of what you've done in laying down your life for me and living the perfect life. Now I have been given eternal life and forgiveness. This chorus is actually a, a great summary of what it is that we confess as Christians, especially as Lutherans. If you go back... 500 years ago to the Reformation, Martin Luther started the Reformation really based on five solas. Uh, they were statements, short statements, that really said, this is what we believe as Protestants. And they were a, a bit different than the teachings at the time of the Roman Catholic Church. One of those things, or a couple of them that I want to highlight through this chorus is this. Luther said, sola fide. In other words, I am saved by faith alone in Christ. If I look at myself and what I've done in this life, if I look at the works that I've produced, sure, maybe I could boast of some good, but none of which can earn my salvation, none of which can earn my place in God's kingdom. It is only by my faith in Christ and what he has done for me that I am called a child of God and given the promise of eternal life and the forgiveness of sins. Sola fide. But another thing that Luther also said in one of those solas was sola gratiae. What that means is by God's grace alone. It's only by his grace that I'm able to stand here before him and be called his child. Because if I look at my life and I look at my brokenness and the sins of my heart and the things that I do that I know that I shouldn't do day after day, it's only by God's grace that I'm saved. It can't be by my own doing. Because even just a little bit of sin corrupts all of us. And all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So this is what we stand on. It's what Luther was saying 500 years ago. I am saved, as it says in Ephesians, saved by grace through faith alone in Christ alone. So as we make that confession this morning, we stand before our God and we confess the reality that we bring nothing before him of worth, that all our works are like filthy rags, and that there's much sin in addition that we carry with us. And as the Lord looks upon us with all of our brokenness, what he does is he says to us, you are forgiven. You are forgiven in full on account of what? Of what he has done for us, on account of the life that he has lived for us. And thus we are forgiven, we are renewed, and we walk away sanctified as chosen children of God who go out into the world and share that same love and promise with our neighbor. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, most gracious God, Lord, we come before you confessing unto you that, Lord, we have tried to earn our way uh, into your kingdom. Uh, that, Father, we have boasted in the works of our hands and our status. Uh, we have boasted in our efforts and tried to climb up to you. Yet, Father, your word is very abundantly clear that there's nothing that we can do within and of ourselves to achieve our salvation, that it is a gift that has been given to us freely on account of the death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, his righteousness is now our righteousness, and we receive it by faith alone. The grace that Christ offers to us, we receive by faith alone, not by works, but Lord, by what you have done, washing us away, Lord, of all of our sins, making us anew. Father, as we have been proclaimed forgiven by what you have done for us, Father, we ask that as renewed and transformed children of God, you may use us for your glory, Lord. 
that as we would be sanctified, Lord, we would be sent out into the world as your ambassadors and servants to love others, to be generous, to share truth and love, to help others in need, and Lord, to be able to share your gospel promises with a world that is very much broken. So Father, we stand before you confessing our brokenness, receiving your forgiveness and absolution and being transformed by your Holy Spirit to go out into the world as your people. Father, we ask all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Brothers and sisters, please join me in reciting these words of corporate confession and absolution together as brothers and sisters in Christ. Almighty God, we acknowledge and confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. Deepen within us our sorrow for the wrong we have done and the good that we have left undone. Lord, you are full of compassion and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. There is always forgiveness with you. Restore to us the joy of your salvation. Bind up that which is broken. Give light to our minds, strength to our wills, and rest to our souls. Speak to each of us and let your word abide with us until it has wrought us your holy will. We humbly ask these things in the name of our Redeemer, your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Brothers and sisters, with that being your confession of sin and my confession of sin, our gracious Father announces to us through the Son the forgiveness of all of our sins. As a called and ordained servant of the Word, it is my joy, honor, and blessing to announce unto you and to myself, a grave sinner, the forgiveness of all of your sins. All of your sins have been forgiven in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. for today comes from Paul's New Testament book of Colossians, chapter 3, from verses 1 to 17. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, 
where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not of things here on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetedness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And in whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God, we believe God the Father Almighty, through his Son and the Holy Spirit, the triune God, one God now and forever, is watching over us, is here for all of us, is, knows where we were, where we are, and where we're going. He knows our every need. He blesses us abundantly, even when we don't deserve it. He forgives our sins when we don't deserve it. And he sent his son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to live, to die, and then to conquer death for us, that we may have eternal life in him. People of God, I invite you to say the words of the Apostles' Creed with me, professing this faith that we have. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, 
maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. If you're at home, stand up. <laughs> so at this time, we will dismiss our friends pre-K through grade five to OS Kids. So you can go downstairs. Uh, Miss Roma and Miss Margaret are in the back waiting for you. And today, uh, we'll be learning about the Old Testament Judge Gideon. So despite some really grave and not great odds against him, Gideon was given strength by the Lord to bring the people to, um, through battle and be victorious. So parents, you can pick them up after, uh, after service today. Don't forget, or we, we caffeinate them. And, oh, come on, guys. <laughs> Um, and ask them what they learned. Ask them about Gideon. Ask them about what that lesson meant. Um, and take that time to, to grow in faith together. It's a really nice way um, to have some conversations about what you believe and what they believe and, and grow in faith as a family. It's also the time uh, where we pull out our phones and we check in on Facebook. So we check in on OSNY on Facebook um, because it's our way of further carrying out our mission of being the neighborhood church. So not just in our local neighborhood here, but our global neighborhood around the world. And we do this through partners. So for the month of May, which we're now in, we are very proud to be partnering with Convoy of Hope. So for every 10 check-ins to OSNY on Facebook, you're providing a day of life-changing education for mothers um, to be helping their families. So Convoy of Hope, the way they do this is they train and educate women, including expectant mothers, in early childhood development, in nutrition, in health, hygiene, literacy, cooking, and even small-scale agriculture, so helping them to earn a wage as well. So mothers' clubs come together, and they put mothers and expected mothers in position to be able to help their families thrive. It's a really great mission that they have. Um, and if you want to learn more about Convoy of Hope, you can go to convoyofhope.org. Um, but I really do encourage you to check in. It's a great partner that we have this month. They're all great. Um, and, and this one is included in that. And our hashtag for this month, because I know you guys are all about the hashtags. I mean, you've got to stop texting me ahead of time to ask what the hashtag is going to be. <laughs> Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's hashtag women's empowerment. And finally, it's a time in our worship where we pause to take an offering. So an offering is a time for, um, for us to give thanks to God for what we received. Uh, for those who consider this place, OSNY, their home church, to be able to give back. Um, and if you have been giving back, just a little thank you to you. Thank you for your generosity. Thank, for, thank you for all you do to make this mission and ministry possible. Uh, we really couldn't do it without you, and we are very grateful. If you're visiting here today for the first time, if you're tuning in on, on the live stream for the first time, also you can sit down. Um, please don't feel any obligation to give. We're just happy that you're with us. Uh, if you do anything, please just let us know how you found us and how we can pray for you. So you can do that in the back through an info card. You can slide into the DMs. You can comment. You can text us. Um, but we would love to know how you found us and how we can pray for you. And if you consider OSNY your home church, you're a regular on the live stream, we welcome and invite your prayer requests as well. So same methods um, for sharing those. And then whether you want those in the prayers of the people or you want Pastor Anthony to pray for you privately, uh, either way, we are happy to do that. It's truly a blessing and an honor. So if you are feeling moved to give today, there are a number of ways you can do that. Um, you can do that uh, through an envelope as the plates are passed through. You can do it online through our website, through our app, or through text, and all that's up on the screens. But before we do anything, let's pause for a moment and reflect on this week's scripture of stewardship. So for today, our scripture of stewardship is taken from the Apostle Paul's letter to the Romans. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality from Romans 12, verse 13. So this verse from Romans, it actually comes from a, big, a much larger passage and in which Paul is providing a description of the marks of a Christian. So how do you know a Christian when you see one? 
And there are many elements of this. Genuine love, showing honor to one another, blessing your enemies. And the thing that they all have in common is that they all stem from putting God first and trusting in Him, which manifests in us letting go of our anxiety, letting go of our worry about small things like quarrels or how we'll be perceived if we show affection to someone, or our possessions, including money. So giving and showing hospitality is a demonstration of our faith in the Lord and recognition that we only have these things because of Him. Our Heavenly Father knows our every need and He freely gives to us, even giving His only Son, Jesus, for us. He also has so much more in store for us beyond this world. May we stand assured in the Father's love so that we can cast off our anxiety and live the marks of a true Christian, including through our giving. Amen. Let me
again our savior good morning thank you again for being here if you're first time guest with us thank you so much for joining us my name is pastor anthony uh we never take it lightly when we have a first time guest who comes and checks us out it's not an easy thing to come and check out a new church and see new weird faces uh so we're very very grateful that you would come and join us uh, especially on such a beautiful day uh we're beginning or continuing, should I say, a sermon series called How to Be Christian on Social Media, something that Christians, all people struggle with, is how we should appropriately carry ourselves, not just in the real world, but in the digital world as well, as we see our world currently is becoming more and more digitized as the normal means of communication. To start off this morning, I want to kind of jump into like a historical anecdote, uh, an allusion, if you will, to history and something that was very prominent uh, in trying to help us understand this kind of leap that we've made through centuries technologically. Lutherans are no strangers to the successful use of mass media, especially, of course, in service to the church. You guys all know about the Gutenberg printing press. Gutenberg printing press was invented in the mid-15th century, roughly around 1450, by Gustav Gutenberg, about half a century before Martin Luther, the spark plug of the Protestant Reformation. About a half a century before Luther nails his 95 theses to the church in Wittenberg, this guy, Gustav Gutenberg, invents the printing press. Luther absolutely embraced this new technology. He used the printing press as a vital tool in the spread of his teachings. To give you an idea, to put this into perspective, there's a historian, Mark Edwards, who wrote about this. And he described Luther's effective use of this new print media. Mark Edwards said this, not only did the Reformation see the first large-scale media campaign, but it also saw a campaign that was overwhelmingly dominated by one person, Martin Luther. More works by Luther were printed and reprinted by any other publicist. Luther outpublished all of his Catholic opponents Five to three. It's kind of crazy to think about, right? You could almost argue that if not for the printing press, the Reformation perhaps would not have been ignited in the manner that it was. This technological invention that changed the dynamic of the world was used by the church for the growth and the Reformation of practices. For me personally, I look at this point in this, this, this event in history, this major milestone, and I, say, I ask myself, and I, I say to myself, it's hard to imagine how the Protestant Reformation would have been ignited without the invention and the technology of the printing press. Now, it's 500 years later, and we look at the printing press kind of like it's by Fisher Price. But in reality, what we know is that our technology has advanced dramatically from 
the printing press. And today's mass media is more effective and seamless than ever before. And at the helm of this, at the helm of our means of communicating in the world, is social media. Now, there's, there's no doubting the fact that the likes of Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram have actually served as blessings in our world. To not say so would be a, would, would be a gross understatement. These technologies, these social medias, have served as a blessing in our world, just as the printing press was five centuries ago. I mean, consider disconnected families that have been united and brought back together. Think about the support groups that exist for those who have cancer, who have been diagnosed, and people are there supporting one another and loving one another. Or think about activists for social justice and how they've been given this powerful platform to fight and advocate for equality. Now, it'd be ignorant, it would be ignorant for us to think that social media is all bad. There's a lot of good that happens there. But we also know there is a very dark side to social media. One, that we would be ignorant to say that we ourselves have not participated in. Former Facebook executive, I guess there's a reason why he's a former Facebook executive. His name is Chamath Palihaptia. I probably mispronounced this wrong. I'm sorry, Chamath left the company in 2011. And he describes how social media, the invention of Facebook, has kind of changed the dynamic of the world as we live in it today. He says this. He says the short-term, dopamine-driven feedback loops that we have created are destroying how our society works. That's a bold statement. There's no more civil discourse. No more cooperation. There's misinformation. There's mistruth. And this is a global problem. It is eroding the core foundations of how people behave by and between each other. Wow. This is one of the pioneers, if you will, execs of Facebook laying it down, destroying how society works. We're more connected than we've ever been before, but we talk less than ever before. Or we don't know how to talk anymore. There's no room for civil discourse. We just yell. There's no cooperation. There's just conflict. What's truth? So much misinformation. You see, technology is only a blessing if we use it to the glory of God and the blessing of our neighbor. But like we know, like anything else that exists in the world, that hasn't always been the case. We've taken something that is a beautiful creation and we've corrupted it. As ambassadors for Jesus, we're called to first and foremost represent him in all spheres of life, digital and real. With that being said, we need to ask ourselves these questions. How can we best use, or if necessary, avoid the use of the technology of social media to glorify God, to build up his body in the church, and to extend his kingdom in the world? We need to wrestle with that. Now, the, the prominence of the internet and social media has impacted countless facets of our lives. And one of the more significant effects is on how we view knowledge and how we view authority as a society. You see, due to the ease of online conversations, as well as the plentiful access to information, at the click of a button, everyone is now their own theologian. Everybody's their own doctor. Everybody's their own politician. Everybody's their own scientist. You see, since we have such an abundance of information and misinformation, 
as well as our own personal opinions, the manner in which we relate to experts and authority figures has absolutely diminished. The abundance of perspectives and the abundance of knowledge, both accurate and inaccurate, has really discouraged us from believing in such a thing as objective truth. Combine that trend with the open mic, if you will, of Facebook and Twitter, and what you get are ugly confrontations spurred on by false rumors and snide remarks. We've largely misused the gift that God has given to us of technology in our hands to sin not only against him, but as well against our neighbor by sharing false information and also seeking to tarnish the reputations of others. We have intentionally sought those things out through the means of the technology we have. In the scriptures, there's a specific word for this type of sin, and it's actually used throughout both testaments of the Bible very, very commonly. It actually originates from the Eighth Commandment. Thou shalt, ne'er, shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Paul talks about this sin plentifully. One place where he's talking about it is in his writing to the early church of Colossae. He says in Colossians 3, verse 8 through 9, 9, it says, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices. Slander. To slander someone is, is to make an accusation that is maliciously uttered with the intention of damaging someone's name. And though oftentimes we believe as slander as being an expressing or a, a preaching or talking about a false charge, the Bible talks about slander in a context where it's also potentially circulating a truth with the intent of harming another person. So slander isn't just about I'm speaking lies about my neighbor to damage their reputation. It could also be I'm going to take something really ugly about this person's life, a mistake that they've made, and I'm going to constantly talk about it to make them look worse. That's another slide of slander as well. The New Testament translation, if you go back to the Koine Greek that the New Testament was originally written in, to slander in Greek is actually written, said, Diabolo. <laughs> it's crazy, right? The Greek translation of the word to slander is Diabolo. Looks awfully like Diablo. <laughs> The etymology of this word is no coincidence. This is why, as pastors, you go back and you study Greek and Hebrew because the words that, these, that the English translation came from gives you a whole other layer of understanding of what these authors were saying. This isn't a coincidence. Slandering another person is an act that is motivated by Satan, who wants us to share lies and wants us to speak evil of one another, something that Satan excels at. I think about what Satan, how he's slandered us. You're going to let this jerk into heaven? Look at all the sins he has. Look at his life. It's messed up. He says he's not going to sin against you, and he sins every day. Satan excels at slandering, and when he sees us doing it, He's absolutely overjoyed. Such mischievous storytelling and, and gossip creates a discord between God's children, but it also results oftentimes in our own demise, the one who is doing the slandering. 
that Paul makes himself abundantly clear here. This is some of Paul's most direct and clear moral teaching of what it looks like to be a Christian here. He says to the church of Colossae, refraining from slander is a vital qualification for Christian citizenship. Living a life where you attempt, as the Holy Spirit allows you to, to refrain from slandering another is a vital characteristic and quali qualification for one who is a citizen of God's kingdom. As children of God, we must remove the sin of mouth and keyboard from us and cease from spreading lies and smearing people's reputations to speak false remarks or false, false rumors or to speak malicious comments is symptomatic of a heart that is misaligned. One that has been motivated by bitterness. One that has been motivated by jealousy. One that has been motivated by unforgiveness and a slew of other sins. Paul reminds us here, Colossians 3 verse 5, he says, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. These earthly habits that we have of speaking ill about our neighbors and gossiping about them and trying to ruin and tarnish their reputation by spreading false rumors or talking about the wrong that they've done in the past. Paul says, you need to put that to death. You need to kill it. If you're a social media user, you might be familiar with these hecklers that exist on social media. And they're called... Twitter trolls. Have you heard of this? Twitter trolls? Man, these guys are ruthless. I mean, some of the stuff they say is actually kind of funny. But they are ruthless. A Twitter troll, for those of you who are kind of unfamiliar, and again, it's just a new term for something that's already existed. It's like the bully in class, if you were like, you know, before the internet age, who kind of poked fun and spoke, you know, false accusations. about. Now they're doing it behind a computer. That's a Twitter troll. Okay? A Twitter troll is someone who slanders and bullies another person through Twitter. However, to be clear, it's not just through Twitter. They could also do so through Facebook or whatever other social media exists. The troll chooses to hide behind the safety of a computer screen or a smartphone as they cast false accusations and crude comments and even potentially dangerous and unhealthy what our world loves today, conspiracy theories, false rumors. I want to show you a few examples of these trolls at work in the world. For those of you who are familiar with late night television, Jimmy Kimmel, uh, he has a segment, I spoke about it briefly last week, I alluded to it, known as Celebrity Mean Tweets. Now, in this part of the show, you have athletes, you have celebrities, you also have politicians, actually, who read out harsh comments, slanderous tweets, written by other people about themselves. So they're reading tweets about themselves that other people have written. Now, some of them are very distasteful. Some of them are very vulgar. I'm not going to obviously show you those ones in church. <laughs> but they actually make for pretty great TV. <laughs> Big surprise, right? But Jimmy Kimmel's one of the primetime ABC guys on late night television. It sells. It makes for some pretty entertaining TV. I'll confess to you, to you as I've read them, I laugh. But there's a very, very dark side to it. Here's one example. I have three examples that I've pulled out. Matthew Perry. Marisol's wearing a friend's shirt over there in the back. I saw that. Good timeliness over there, yeah. Matthew Perry is an um, actor who's made a hugely, hugely successful career off the uh, great TV show, historically successful TV show, Friends. He reads a tweet that somebody wrote about him, says that, I have Matthew Perry syndrome. I'm a, I'm a sarcastic loser with a giant head. And you see Matthew Perry's face there. How about Paul Ryan? Paul Ryan was the 54th Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives. Someone wrote this about Paul Ryan. Paul Ryan has such pretty blue eyes. 
sometimes it's easy to forget that he's Satan incarnate. We're not done. These are tame. These are actually very tame. And this is like PG-13. Actually PG. Maybe even G compared to some of the other ones. How about Daniel Radcliffe? Who doesn't love Daniel Radcliffe? Come on. Harry Potter for a decade, right? Somebody wrote this about Daniel Radcliffe. As he reads it, Daniel Radcliffe is one of God's most unattractive creations since the aardvark. If, if, if you've you got to catch up on your biology, the aardvark is an anteater. It's got that really long schnauz. Wow! <laughs> Wow. And this is tame. This is tame. These examples, they might give us a good laugh. They might sell for televisions. And these, these athletes, these celebrities and politicians, they could read them and get a smirk off of it, maybe. But there's a very, very dark side to this. And there's a very dark reality that actually includes slander resulting into the destruction of people's lives their reputations, also mental health through social media, depression, anxiety, suicide, death threats. Things have gotten, this is how out of hand things have gotten on social media. Things have gotten so out of hand with slander that celebrities, politicians, and even the average Joe, like myself, have actually tried to and successfully sued other people for digital defamation. It's a legal term now. It's a real thing. You could take somebody to court for defaming your reputation online. That's how elevated and escalated this has gotten. Such behavior for us, ambassadors for Christ, should be put away from us, Paul says. In a social media world where such behavior has become the norm, we don't, we're not surprised when we see comments like this anymore. How can we, as Paul says, put off the old self? How do we put this kind of behavior behind us? Looking back to Colossians, Colossians, Paul shows his listeners a way. He says, you're going to put off this old self. He says to them this, Colossians 3, verse 12 through 13. He says, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if you do have a complaint against another, forgive them. Forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Do you notice anything about the choice of language and the imagery that Paul uses throughout Colossians 3 here? There's a lot of put on, put off. Put on. It's like Ninja Turtles. Wash on, wash off. Wash on, wash off. Put on and put off. Put on and put off. Paul, what the heck are you talking about? What am I putting on? What am I taking off? Put off and put on. Uh, just as a person puts off, takes off dirty and stained clothes and they put on pure and radiant attire, Paul is saying that we are to put to death our earthly ways and to be made new in Christ's image. Okay, so where then? Where and how do we achieve and find, where do we find, where do we get this attire, this redeeming garment that we can wear? Where do we find it so that we can put it on? Brothers and sisters, you already have it. It's already been given to you. It's in your wardrobe, but you forget about it. We forget about it. In baptism, you have put on Christ, 
and you have entered into a saving relationship with Jesus by faith. You see, we tend to talk about baptism in this kind of cultural sentiment and perspective where we talk about it's something that happened in our life and it's something that I did as my confession of faith. But if you look at the scriptural way in which baptism is taught, what you'll realize is that it goes way beyond what our earthly minds believe happens in this, in this sacrament. What Paul is saying is that at the point of your baptism, the old self in you was put off and Jesus put on you himself. He gave you that radiant attire to replace the one that was stained that we were wearing. He gave you the garment to put on. In baptism, you have put on Christ and you have entered into a saving relationship with Jesus by faith. God's image was lost in all of us on account of Adam's original sin that now exists in all of us. But it has now been restored to us through the waters of baptism. And if you don't believe me, look at what Paul says one chapter before. The Colossians 2, right before. Context is key in the scriptures. Colossians 2. Look at what he says to his listeners here. In him, in Christ, also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. A circumcision without hands. A marking that you are God's chosen child that's not done with hands, but is done by the Spirit. That's a reference to baptism. And if you missed that one, don't worry, because he says, by putting off the body of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith. In other words, in baptism, you have died to yourself and you have died to your sin. And through the waters of baptism, Christ has brought you through as a new living creation. It's in baptism where you die and you are born again. It happens through the waters of baptism. The Father has given us this priceless, this tangible gift of life and salvation so that we may die to the ways of the world and live lives that are renewed. As we put on the robe of righteousness that Jesus has offered to us in our baptism, we are then sent to produce the fruits of the Spirit as we celebrate and we exhibit the redemption that has already been won for us. So rather than slandering our neighbors for whatever gripes we have against them, and I'm not suggesting that we, live in, that we don't live in a messed up world where people do messed up things, but that doesn't change the way that we're supposed to respond to them as Christians. Rather than slander our neighbors for whatever wrongs have been done against us, faith in our baptism has called us and made us to be a kind, humble and forgiving people. Paul makes it clear. He says, as the Lord has forgiven you of all of your sins through the sacrament of baptism, now you can go and you can forgive your trespassers, both in real life and online, as opposed to trying to intentionally go and ruin someone's reputation. In 2019, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, which is the synod that we belong to, wrote a report on Christians and social media. Tremendously insightful report. You can find it online. The Commission on Theology and Church Relations made some really, really insightful points on the trends of social media in our world and also in the church today. One of those points that was made, it hit me like a stack of bricks. I got to tell you, I was like, O-M-G. This was one of the points that was made. If this doesn't speak to you, I don't know. Our social media doesn't shape us. It exposes us. Whew. Wow. I should take a seat for a minute. 
our social media doesn't shape us. It exposes us. What? You mean Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok, Tinder? You name it. All of them are just revealing what is already broken in us. All of them are just revealing what is already deep within our hearts. Sin. Our lust, our anger, our slanderous ways. Social media is just exposing the brokenness that exists. But Jesus, through our baptisms, he has stripped us of our old self. He has drowned the old Adam in us and he has covered us with his righteousness in the new self through baptism and in faith of what he has achieved for us through this sacrament. Rather than slander our neighbors as baptized children of God, we can now speak the truth to them in love and we can pursue gentle correction. We can be patient with our trespassers when they offend us. We can forgive them rather than try to destroy them. It's about time we do some spring cleaning, right? We're in the middle of May. Clean out that wardrobe. Find, as Isaiah says it, the robe of righteousness that has been given to you in this baptism regardless of how long ago it might be that you received it, whether it be as an infant, whether it be later on in life, whether it be that you have not yet been baptized, this sacrament assures you of the promise of life and the transformation of your hearts by faith. Receive the robe of righteousness that Christ has placed on you and remember who he has called you to be as his child. Amen. Brothers and sisters, this morning we've spent much time reflecting on the sacrament of baptism. That through this baptism that we have received, we have the reassurance of our salvation as well as the forgiveness of all of our sins. But when we talk about sacraments, we also know that the sacrament of the Lord's Supper is a means by which God gives to us not just in remembrance, but actually hands to us his grace and his mercy and his forgiveness. This sacrament, as well as the one of baptism, are tangible gifts that God has given to you and me so that we may never forget what he has done for us through his son, Jesus Christ. So hear these words of what Christ has done for you. On the night that our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, was betrayed, he took bread. And when he broke it, he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take and eat. This is my body, which has been broken for you. Do this as often as you eat of it in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, when he had given thanks, he took the cup and he poured it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, take and drink this cup is the new covenant of my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. This is the true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ given to his baptized children for the forgiveness of all their sins and the promise of eternal life. I'd like to invite up the band uh, as well as tech to receive the Lord's Supper first. And then we will start a line on the right-hand side of the uh, seats, and then we'll move on over to the left-hand side. As we distribute the elements, think of this tangible gift that offers you the reassurance of salvation and peace. Amen.
and sisters, may this very real and true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen us and keep us in this one true faith from now to life everlasting. Amen. Uh, brothers, just a quick announcement. Uh, Dorcas and Newman Nan are going to be traveling to Liberia uh, next Monday. Um, so we want to send them off with some love and with some prayers. Uh, they're going to be going to meet mom and dad and uh, party somewhat in Liberia, uh, and also uh, see how uh, our Savior Liberia churches have been growing. Uh, so we want to send them off with prayers uh, and make sure that they return safely to us with mom and dad as well. Don't leave them in Liberia. Bring them back. <laughs> Let's pray for them. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your servants, uh, the Nan family. Uh, Father, we thank you how you have placed the call upon their hearts, uh, to go back to their native land, Lord, of Liberia, Lord, uh, to be able to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with ears who perhaps have never heard of the name of Christ and what he has done for them. Uh, Father, we thank you for Dorcas and Newman and uh, the blessing that they are to our church family. And Father, we just ask that you would watch over them and guide them, keep them safe in their journey, Lord, and bring them back safely with James and the Yeti, Lord, uh, to our family here, Lord. And uh, as they are there, Lord, may they be witnesses and ambassadors uh, for the love of your Son, Jesus Christ, and his gospel and the advancement of his kingdom. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. And we continue with the prayers of the people. Heavenly Father, Lord, we confess unto you that we've not always used our words, both in the real world and online, to speak truth about our neighbors. Rather, we've told lies and used others' mistakes to tarnish their reputation in the world. May we correct with the truth in love instead of resorting to harmful talk. Through baptism in your Son, Jesus, we have put off the old self of sin and slander and put on the new self of righteousness and gentleness and forgiveness. Help us to remember the people that we've been called. Help us to remember the people we've been called to be as you are chosen on social media as well as in our face-to-face -face interaction. Lord, in your mercy. Redeeming God, you've made us a new creation in Christ Jesus, yet we find that the flesh in us has us resort back to the old Adam and the depraved sinner in us. There are idols, money, sex, power, and vices addictions and other poor habits in our lives that fight for the attention and worship of our hearts. We ask that your Holy Spirit would break us of those earthly addictions and sins of the flesh that occupy our hearts and minds. Your word outlines for us what behaviors and actions are incongruous with the people that you've made us to be. As we receive your absolution for our struggles with sin, we too ask that you would change our hearts so that all that we do may bring glory to you in heaven and blessing to our neighbor. Lord, in your mercy. Compassionate Father, hear our petitions for healing and restoration for our bodies. This life is but a fading vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Our lives sit in the palm of your very hands and exist according to your sovereign will. We ask that you would watch over and give strength and peace to your children who are enduring various thorns in the flesh. By name, we give to you Hugo Keel, Warren Caldecott, Mike Capsio, and his daughter, JD, Elisa and Martin Brewey, Vicky, the aunt of Brian, Sabina, the niece of Margaret, the aunt of Lydia Orego, as well as the Orego family as they mourn the loss of their aunt. Lucy Rodriguez, Patrick Parsatoon, Fursey McCormack, the Habers, and the Nons. Lord, comfort them and all of your people with the promise of everlasting life in Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Chief Shepherd, watch over your flock and the church all over the world. Being a Christian today comes at a price. To some, that price is greater than anything we could ever understand here in our country of freedom. Protect those who are being persecuted in some countries for their confession that Jesus is Lord of all. Give them strength and courage to bear the injustices and discrimination they face on account of their faith. Work through global leaders to ensure the safety and equity of all believers. 
also be with the growth of your kingdom in our country where church attendance continues to decline as well as across the world. Send us, Lord, as your servants to bring others into your flock. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, in this family of faith, we've been called to live life together. This includes engaging as a community beyond Sunday mornings. By your spirit, help us to invest in one another's lives. May we bear one another's burdens and celebrate one another's joys. To those who are in need, may we offer our time, energy, and resources to ensure that all of us are provided for and loved, especially those who are aging and those who are vulnerable. Use community events like Friday night dinner and our weekly discipling group, our weekly discipling groups, as well as summer events such as our Mets baseball game to grow us closer together. Lord, in your mercy. Father, all these prayers, as well as the many unspoken prayers of our hearts, we lift up to you, praying the words your Son, Jesus Christ, taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I ask that you cup your hands in order to receive a blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give to you his peace. You have been blessed to be a blessing. And may the peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ be with you always. Thank you, friends. Have a wonderful week ahead. Make sure if you're interested in joining us for Friday night dinner that you sign up in the back. Peace, friends. <laughs>